Welcome back, everyone, to session three of this year's NIAB Soft Fruit Day. I hope you've enjoyed the first two sessions. This third session now will focus entirely on insect pest control. So just running through the order of things we've got coming up. Uh, we have a, another PhD student, uh, Laura Martinez-Chavez from Harper Adams University, who's going to be talking about aphid resistance to biocontrol. Then uh, I'll take the reins for the next uh, presentation, just reminding people some of the results that we've achieved from an AHDB funded project for aphid capsid and thrips control. We'll have a little bit of information from Francis Momonji on the role of landscape complexity uh, and uh, its impact on pest control. Sarah Arnold will talk us through um, wildflower mixes that she's developed for soft fruit crops. And then we'll have some um, three presentations on spotted winged Sophila from another PhD student, Fardina Rahimi, and then Michelle Fountain about bait sprays. And then we'll finish up at the end of the afternoon with Glenn Slade giving us an update on sterile insect technique. So lots to come. And uh, just a quick reminder, if you can, if those of you who are interested in basis and Neroso points, if you go back to the chat facility and scroll right back up to the top, we put a link in there, which is an online link where you can actually complete your details for basis and Neroso. Uh, also, if any questions that you have, just please post them in the chat room as well and we'll read them out as we go through. So I'm gonna stop sharing now and we're gonna um, invite Laura to join us for the first presentation this afternoon. Laura, if you want to uh, switch your camera on and unmute, there she is. And if you want to share your presentation. Can you, un can you unmute Laura? We can't hear you at the moment. No, you can't unmute. Um, Phoebe, who's working away behind the scenes. I don't know if you're able to. There we are. There you are. Can you hear me? That's fine. We're we're up and running. So if you want to try and share your presentation, Laura. Yes. So just to introduce again, Laura. Laura's a PhD student, a CTP student at Harper Adams University. And uh, we thought this was a good opportunity to kick the afternoon off because we're going to be talking a lot, a lot of biological control. So Laura's going to introduce us to the work that she's doing on trying to understand aphid resistance to biocontrol. So Laura, over to you. All right, can't you see that clearly? That's all but fine, Laura. Yeah, we can see and hear you perfectly. That's good. Right, thank you, Scott. Well, as, as Scott was introducing me, I'm a third year PhD student at Harper Adams, and uh, we are working on trying to understand aphid resistance to biocontrol. Um, there you go. So what is aphid resistance to biocontrol? Basically, uh, aphids uh, have been shown to show some kind of physiological resistance to certain parasitoid species uh, in different crops. Uh, it was first described for the P. aphid, but it's been described in other species around the world right now. So what we know um, is that the potato aphid in the UK can have at least uh, the three different populations uh, that are all included in one genotype uh, that can be resistant to aphidus cervi. This was described 10 years ago in Scotland. And as you can tell, what we call resistant resistance to parasitoids is basically a lower parasitism proportion when the aphids are attacked by the parasitoid, in this case, aphidus cervi. So what we are trying to understand in my project is how this can affect IPM uh, programs in uh, other crops are uh, uh, obviously important like uh, horticultural crops like strawberry crops. So with this background, knowing that these uh, aphid uh, populations, potato aphid populations can be around the country, we want to explore the same thing, but in this case in the strawberries, uh, strawberry crops. So the problem is that um, it has been described early season that early season aphid control uh, as problematic in the last couple of, uh, of, of years in the strawberry. Um, the hypotheses are multiple ones. It might be that uh, temperature affecting how parasitoids uh, interact with the aphids. But uh, obviously the other, the other hypothesis might be that we might have what we call resistance, uh, resistant clones of potato aphid infesting soft fruit crops. When I, when I say clones, that means uh, populations that are, have a, are genetically different and that are, might also have different um, endosymbionts of bacteria inside of them that can help them with this. 
And when I said endosymbionts, I mean secondary endosymbionts because certain bacteria that are, that are described as secondary endosymbionts that mean that they are not necessary for the aphid to reproduce or to survive, they can provide uh, some kind of toxins or produce some kind of proteins that might stop the development of the parasitoid uh, inside of the aphid. So the question is that, are there any kind of resistant uh, populations of fatty to aphid affecting strawberries specifically? And obviously uh, the second question is that, is if that's the case, is that affecting the IPM strategies in the strawberries uh, crops in the UK? So what we've done until now is uh, go around and um, we have had huge help from um, uh, a farm manager in, in Staffordshire to go uh, kind of all, all year and, and the whole season to sample potato aphids in this field. Um, we, we, gone, uh, we got some samples from Scotland, some samples from Kent, some samples from the Midlands. And what we're doing basically is trying to characterize them first. That means that we genotype them, identify the genetic uh, variation, but we also tested for the bacteria inside, inside of them. And um, I want to point that Hamiltonia defensa, which is the first line, has been described as a bacteria that can provide this trait of resistance to parasitoids. So as you can tell, we have different lines, different populations coming from the UK, which are different gen genetically, but are also have different endosymbionts inside of them. Now, the question is, how does this affect, really, their interaction with parasitoids? And that's the last, the, the next bit of my PhD that I'm trying to work with, is trying to understand how these, uh, this whole variation um, uh, can affect IPM strategies and uh, the relationship, especially of potato aphid with aphidiocerbi, which, as my, uh, most of you might know, is one of the uh, most important parasitoid species used for control of potato aphid in strawberries. So these are the results of some um, bioassays or assays that we did in the lab to understand how um, different this, the, these populations of, of potato aphid respond to a feed survey. And as you can tell, uh, uh, we, might, we might think when we apply biological control that all, all the populations might be you know, equally exposed to the parasitoid and therefore that they might you know, uh, have a similar parasitism proportion. But as you can tell here, is done all the same. So basically we have lines which can be described as resistant, for example, lines number six and seven with prosthesis proportions that are lower than 20%. And you can have other lines like line number eight and, in, and uh, 11, uh, in which you can tell that prosthesis proportions are, high, are higher than 50%, which is um, what we look for when, when we apply um, biocontrol. So basically, uh, what you can see is that we don't have uh, an equal response from all the uh, potato aphid uh, populations that we have sample uh, around the UK. And so the question is like, well, um, wh wh what is going on? Is this because of genetic differences inside of the aphids, or is this because of secondary endosymbionts or bacteria that are inside of them? So basically, in this year of PhD, what I've been doing is uh, understanding the role of gen aphid genetics. So basically separating populations by the, the genetic uh, content. And uh, we've done uh, some more specific assays. And what we found basically is that the role of genetics is quite limited. Um, we think that there is more variation in terms of the different populations, not only because of genetics, but because probably of um, other sources like secondary endosymbionts or interactions between the secondary endosymbionts and the genetics themselves. So there is still a lot to understand. But as you can tell here, if you put up a, 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 what we did was uh, a female video survey with a certain numbers of aphids from each uh, population, you can tell that there is variation in the, in, the, in, in the number of hosts that have been attacked, but this variation is not statistically different. And um, in terms of parasitism success, there is also variation between the clonal lines between the populations. But again, this, this doesn't translate statistically. So, um, so we still have a lot to understand. And the next step is to try to dip a little bit, to go a little bit uh, more in, in depth with this um, genetic variation and also introduce other, other components that can affect uh, how parasitoids uh, interact with, with potato aphid. So in summary, we have yeah, 14 lines, different lines from our geographical spread in the UK with different characteristics that can be used, can be used in bioassays to understand a little bit more what's going on. 
but there is definitely different levels of susceptibility. Can we call it resistance? Uh, that's a long discussion, but there is a different levels of susceptibility to a video survey when using, you know, uh, all, all the lines and populations. And when we dip a little bit more about genetics, the role of genetics is quite limited on this aphid prostate interaction. So there's a lot of still to understand. And uh, I'm, I'm, I'm hoping that I can um, do a little bit more these two years that I, I still have, so we can have a better idea of, of what, what's going on. So uh, for the next couple of years, I'm going to start working on how the secondary endosymbionts inside the aphids can have an effect, if that, uh, that effect uh, has any interactions with the aphid genetics themselves, and uh, if we have a, a sort of kind of um, a more complex situation um, in the case of potato aphids uh, attacking strawberries. And obviously, the question is how does this translate in the field? What's going on? And maybe, you know, some of you can 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 um, give me some inputs. What what do you think? Do you see uh, difficulties in 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 controlling potato aphid in strawberries or in other crops? Um, some other hypothesis probably. But uh, what we're seeing right now is that um, definitely um, different levels of susceptibility of do a feed survey can be can be uh, problematic. I can I I, I can be as uh, something important to take uh, into account when um, the, uh, controlling potato aphids in strawberries. So a little bit of sneak peek, we have done some field work in the farm in Staffordshire and uh, we've done uh, one season already trying to understand the abundance of aphids and trying to understand prostitution pressure and uh, how this distributes in, in, the, in different polytunnels. And, uh, and, and we are hoping to go for a second year to understand a little bit more uh, about this. The hope is for us to not only do this aphid abundance and prostate pressure, but also to understand the aphid genetics and endosymbionts in, um, in the whole season in this, in, in this farm and trying to assess how that can affect prostate pressure, um, especially when prostates are um, applied to the field. And if that apl those applications are really uh, doing something or, or, or not. So with that being said, uh, I would like to thank, obviously, my uh, supervisors, Dr. Tom Pop, Joe Roberts from Harper Adams University, uh, Dr. Ali Kali, and Dr. Betan Shaw, Dr. Michelle Fontaine, and Dr. Francis Wamonje from NIAP, and uh, Gaynor Malak from the James Hutton Institute for all the help, and uh, obviously funding from the City Fruit Crop Research, Berry Gardens at the BBC SRC. So um, I'm open to any questions. Uh, please um, thank you, Laura. let me know. Yeah, just the one. Um, uh... Which endosymbionts do you think will be responsible? Yeah. Maybe Wolbachia. That's a question from Michelle. Yeah, uh, we haven't asked for Wolbachia. Only three secondary endosymbionts have, have been described in aphids to have uh, something to do with prostate resistance. And that's uh, Hamiltonia defensa, Serratia symbiotica, and um, uh, Focaccia symbiotica. Uh, we have tested them all uh, for, for all three of them. Some lines have them, some lines don't. So we're now in the process of choosing the lines to do a similar assay as, as uh, the one that I've shown to understand if secondary endosymbionts have something to do with this uh, variation in susceptibility. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, we must leave it there and uh, we'll move on. So if you'd like to stop sharing yeah. uh, and it's my turn next. So I'm going to try and uh, share. There we go. So hopefully everybody can see that. Good. Okay. So um, the reason for this presentation really is just to bring you up to date as a reminder of uh, previous work that AHDB funded uh, on Project SF174. Um, we that that went back even further to project sf156 so this was a project that looked at um pest control looking at novel approaches to capsid aphid and thrips control all pests which were particularly difficult to, to control using um biological mechanisms and techniques and uh, we su succeeded in, in taking things a lot further, and we've developed a number of uh, results from this, which we wanted to share with you again. We have presented some of these in the past, but we wanted just to bring them all together, just to remind you what we had, we had achieved. So 
beginning with uh, capsids, uh, which were traditionally controlled by broad spectrum insecticides uh, and pyrethroids, particularly like calypso, sorry, um, neonicotinoids like calypso. And we needed to try and find some new ways of controlling that. Uh, well, we started with a, a push-pull approach to this. And you may remember that uh, we identified a, a repellent called hexal butyrate which uh, repels capsids, and we use that within the field to push them out to the boundary. And then we used semiochemicals in these green vein, cross, cross uh, vein traps, funnel traps, which pulled the, the capsids in. And we got some very good successes with that, significant reductions in the numbers of capsids, both in strawberries and raspberries, in projects SF156 and SF174A that AHDB funded. And interestingly, um, in addition to the reduction in numbers, we actually saw a reduction in fruit damage using this technique uh, by up to 80% in organic strawberry crops, which was quite a, a success. Um, and since uh, we've done that work, I just wanted to share with you that PC Fruit in Belgium have uh, successfully done some independent trials and they reduced damage by capsids by between 49 and 69%. So again, um, those, those results have been replicated elsewhere. Um, and also more recent experience, talking to Russell IPM, they have told me that they're getting good results with other capsid species, not just common green capsid and European tarnished plant bug, but also with Lyocoris tripustulatus and Lygus sesperus. So um, that seems to be successful or for a range of capsid pests. Now, one of the problems that we often have with the, re the, the research that uh, we do is translating that into actual uh, adoption by the industry and commercial practice. Um, but the good news in this particular case um, was that uh, Russell IPM have now developed this hexabutyrate uh, into a product called Libalty, which is now commercially available from them as a, a, a repellent for use in soft fruit crops. It comes in tablet form. Um, it can be uh, set just alongside the, the bags or uh, the row or indeed between bags. Um, we have found that uh, it's best to deploy it um, immediately on delivery. Um, it will last for three months at 24 degrees C and it's recommended to space the tablets every five meters. Um, it, uh, it can be stored and it can be stored for up to three months in the foil bag that it comes in. Um, but uh, and it, it, it's ideally it's best to, to, to use it from fresh, but it can be stored. Um, the advice from our Russell IPM is to introduce from early spring onwards in organic crops and in conventional crops from June onwards. And so if you're not already using it, it's certainly worth considering trialing that uh, in your business. So I think quite a positive result from that work, which has led to a commercial reality, which is good news. Um, now, another, another aspect of this work was to look at aureus because a number of commercial growers have um, had some, I suppose, commercial experience of using aureus. And there was some feeling or thinking that aureus when used for Western flower thrips could also give some control of capsids. Um, and we wanted really to test that and find out a bit more. Initially, I suppose you would call it anecdotal evidence, but we did some laboratory tests. Uh, and in labs, we did find significantly fewer uh, Ligus nymphs, uh, li Ligus uh, rugulpenis, so that's the tarnished plant bug, fewer nymphs uh, emerging from eggs where aureus was present in laboratory tests. We moved on to field trials in 2022, and unfortunately, we didn't get any significant reduction in Ligus rugula penis, um, or indeed the damage that it causes on strawberry, which was obviously a little bit disappointing. And the conclusions that the, the team um, who were working on that drew at that point was, although Aureus may be contributing to some extent, you wouldn't want to rely on it um, wholly for control of capsids. So moving on, um, we turned our attention also to aphids, again in project SF156 uh, and uh, SF174, sorry, in SF156, we did some work which showed that 
um, the use of biological control and particularly natural control was quite successful for aphids, um, but not unfortunately until later in the season, by which time the aphids had done their damage. So we wanted to try and do a little bit more investigation of natural control in strawberries. And we um, looked at uh, the use of potential use of hoverflies, which are natural predators of um, aphids. And we had been aware of their um, presence in the previous work that we'd done. And we wanted to try and consider whether we could try and introduce them early into the crop during the season, because very often aphid colonies will build up rapidly in the spring. And it's very hard to get control of them with aphicides at that time of year, partly because of the temperatures. Biopesticides are also difficult to get control um, of or, or to use to control at that stage in the season because of temperatures. So our thinking was, let's try and get some hoverflies in early to see um, if we can reduce aphid colonies. And we add volatiles to that to, to actually retain the hoverflies in the crop. So we initially used Magipal. Uh, Magipal, as you probably know, uh, is quite a useful product because it, it enhances the numbers of beneficials whilst also pushing out um, insect pests. Uh, so we combined that with other volatiles um, and it did show some early promise, but no significant treat differences between the treatments. <clears throat> In 2022, uh, we tested some other volatiles on a larger scale to try to attract naturally occurring hoverflies rather than introduced. Um, but unfortunately, although it did, again, it did work, it only worked when the colonies of aphids were large enough. So when the, the colonies were still small, we were struggling to get that attraction, the important attraction in for the hoverflies to, to do their job properly. So we then turned our attention to aphid parasitoids. And effectively, we, we were looking at three different things here. Do the parasitoids overwinter? Uh, in aphid colonies, because if they do, we could then perhaps rely on them more in the spring months. Also, how much do the parasitoid uh, releases help to boost existing levels of parasitism? So in other words, if we've got some existing parasitoids there overwintering, can we boost the numbers by introducing early in the season? And also to identify the impact that they have on aphid numbers uh, after their release. And uh, NIAB scientists work with James Hutton Institute scientists on this uh, to collaborate uh, on overwintering colonies. We found that parasitoids do have overwinter and they do multiply up in number in spring as the aphid colonies increase. So that was good news. Um, the downside was that further releases of parasitoids uh, that we um, made um, did not seem to increase the levels of parasitism, which was slightly disappointing. But the important thing from this work really is to know if you've got parasitoids in the crop, because if you do, and they are overwintering, and we obviously understand and recognize that they do overwinter, then you may make better use of them in the spring. And it may be important to avoid certain types of spray to ensure that those populations uh, continue to thrive. So moving on to thrips and um, I should say at the start of this, Western flower thrips has been reasonably well controlled by lots of growers in recent years through introduction of Neocelis cucumeris, predatory mites, uh, and as well as in combination with aureus. And generally, I think uh, most growers have, have cracked this one and are getting uh, commercially acceptable control with very large introductions of Neocelis cucumeris on a weekly basis from spring onwards. But um, we started to find other, or the industry had started to find other in, uh, thrip species, or we thought other thrip species causing problems and causing some further damage. So Project SF174 investigated this further, and uh, this work was done by ADAS scientists uh, in collaboration with NIAB. Um, and inevitably, Western flower thrips, as we, we know, is a problem. But the work that the ADAS scientists did suggested that there were various other species, including rubus thrips, onion thrips, rose thrips, and flower thrips, which could all potentially, in certain situations, be causing damage. The problem with some of these other species is that sometimes they don't overwinter. Some of them are flying into the crop. So we felt that it was important to try and understand and learn a bit more about uh, which species were arriving and when they were arriving and uh, how we might control them. So we started doing some research um, using um, both sticky traps uh, and uh, lures to try and attract some of these 
um, flying thrips into the crop. So we used Lurem uh, TR, which contains methyl isonicotinate, uh, as well as Thripnot, which has a semiochemical in it. Um, and we were using these blue sticky traps um, that were um, hung under the table. So if you see that right hand photograph or image there, the, these traps were hung just below the, the tabletop system. Um, and uh, unfortunately, we went uh, either using the sticky traps on their own or with these, um, we didn't get any increase in catches of these thrips. But we then found that placing the sticky traps above the tables did increase catches, and the addition of the, the lures, Lurem and Thripnock, uh, increased those catches further. So um, we also found that uh, more damaging species, uh, sorry, non-damaging species, I should say, such as cereal thrips, were caught more on the traps below the canopy. So I think the lesson from this is that if you're going to use uh, sticky traps and lures for these other thrips uh, to monitor for them, best to do so by uh, using them above the crop canopy in a tabletop system. Um, and if you've got any below, then they tend to be catching the, the non-damaging species. So um, hopefully some useful information that's come out of that. Um, just in a couple of minutes that I've got left, I um, just want to say a few words about um, another pest that we did some work on in Project SF174. Uh, and this was uh, some midges, raspberry cane midge and blackberry leaf midge. Uh, the raspberry cane midge, I think, is well known to most people in the industry, the larvae um, hatching out on the um, periderm uh, of the primocanes feeding damage, causing subsequent fungal infection and causing midge blight, which you can see in that top left photograph, uh, and the blackberry leaf midge causing this characteristic damage. Um, blackberry leaf midge, I should add, affects both, straw, uh, affects both raspberries and blackberries, laying its eggs in the primocane tips and the larvae hatching out, feeding on these tips and causing this curling uh, and it can, can lead to branching and death of the, the primocane tip. So what could we try and consider doing with these? So within Project SF174, we actually looked at a push-pull approach there as well. Um, the push was again using uh, Magipal sashes in these um, traps, the red traps, and the pool component was uh, using the white roller sticky traps as, as uh, in combination with species specific sex pheromones. Now, interesting with the raspberry cane midge, uh, in this small trial, and I should add it was a very small trial, we had fewer midges recorded in the treated plots, um, but there were no significant reduction in midge damage or, or midge uh, larvae on the canes. So um, slightly mixed result. We had a better result with blackberry leaf midge, where we had both fewer midges in the plots and a corresponding reduction in damage to the leaves and shoots. Now, this was just a very, very small scale trial, so we, we're not confident to recommend it, but it may be that in future we could do some further work on this to see if we could uh, develop that to a point where we've had more confidence to recommend it to the industry. And finally, as part of this project, we continue to do some pest surveillance. So just out of interest, uh, we were surveying for other invasive pests or new pests to the industry. Uh, and we found a range of things, a Japanese flower thrips, a Taiwanese flower thrips and a chili thrips. We found marmorated brown, sorry, brown marmorated stink bug and yellow spotted stink bug. Um, the tree fruit industry is particularly um, knowledgeable about brown marmorated stink bug because it uh, potentially could cause a lot of damage to apples and pears. Uh, a new white fly, honeysuckle white fly was picked up. Also white peach scale, Indian wax scale and tortoise wax scale were um, picked up along the way. Um, six new beetles that we hadn't been aware of before and several tortrix moths and a spider mite, Tetranicus mexicanus, which threatens to cause damage in glasshouse crops. So um, <clears throat> that surveillance um, is always useful and we continue to do that where we possibly can. Uh, and we have done so in the tree fruit industry too. So, um, Really, um, the purpose of this was just to bring you back uh, as a reminder to bring you back up to date with what we found from that work. Thanks to our collaborators, uh, ADAS, James Hutton Institute, Keele University, University of Greenwich and Russell IPM for all their help in that. And a good example of some collaborative work uh, between organisations. And above all, thank you to the AHDB um, who funded that work. And I think it's been useful work 
as we move forward with finding new methods of biological control. So I'm going to just stop sharing there. And um, I think we're just about spot on time. I don't know if anybody's got any questions. Um, yeah, quite a little bit of questioning coming there. Thank you to Michelle, who's been answering some of these. Uh, Michelle Fountain, my co colleague who led that work. Um, there is a question here, Michelle. I don't know if you're available. Um, have, have we tried sticky blue traps closer to the ground, um, around 20 to 30 centimetres above the ground? With traps on strings or banners between posts. Um, yes, any experience of that? Uh, no, Scott. I was trying to type a reply, but for some reason it keeps cancelling itself. Ah. So I'll, I'll just say it instead. Um, that's a really good point, actually. It's a that's a good strategy if you're looking for what's emerging from the ground. Um, I think the staff at ADAS were focusing on trying to estimate what might actually be in the flowers in the crop, um, and the reason they put uh, sticky traps underneath and on top is because most growers find it um, more practical to have the sticky traps underneath where the, the sprayer boom isn't touching them but actually having the sticky traps above the crop is more representative of what is actually in the flowers at that time and they also with the growers they were working with didn't have an issue with them with the spray booms as well so we'd probably recommend sticky traps above the crop if you want to know what's actually in the flowers OK, um, one other thing that I didn't add in, which I should add, or may maybe Michelle wants to say something, but um, in terms of future work on aphids, um, Growing Kent and Medway, who talked to us this morning, Growing Kent and Medway are funding uh, a new research project with Michelle and her team looking at control, biological control of large raspberry aphid uh, under, under protection. Um, Michelle, do you want to say anything about that or do you want me to say more about what you're um, trying to look at there? Well, I've just seen Francis appear, and Francis is actually the lead of that project. So <laughs> we'll leave that to Francis. <laughs> All right, Francis, do you want to say just a few words? Because I understand you're going to be using um, brown lace wings and common green lace wings as well, uh, as, as well as looking at parasitoids. So just a, a quick word on that, if you may. Yes, we are. So uh, the, what we want to do in that project is to optimize the use of uh, different uh, components, which are used in bio control. So this would be parasitoids. This already been deployed. And uh, brown lacewing also being deployed and green lacewing. However, so far that has not been really effective. And what we want to do is to study the phenology of both the plant, um, the pest and these parasitoids uh, across an entire season. And then we'll optimize how we deploy them in year two um, across a season and then study that to see whether it can be more effective. Good. OK, thank you. Well, thank you. Michelle. We'll be hearing more from Michelle later. And uh, Francis, thanks for that update. And that brings us nicely into our next presentation because Francis is our next speaker. Uh, and Francis is going to be talking a little bit today about um, the role of landscape complexity and abundance of predators and pollinators. And I think this is a general theme that Michelle's team is working on now, trying to harness natural populations of insects uh, uh, to try and control pe insect pests and we we're forced to make more use of this type of approach purely because we're having fewer and fewer products um, and we're really just scratching the surface but Francis is going to tell you a little bit more about a specific project uh, on this called AgroBioConnect. So Francis. Thank you. Do I have a full screen? Um, no, if you can press the slide slideshow. Yeah, sorry, it seems to skip onto the other. Okay, do you want to just try that again? Let me try again. That's better. Perfect. Mm -hmm. Yeah, all good to go. Thank you, Francis. Okay, um, thank you. Now I have to figure out how to, oh, there we go. So I'm going to speak a bit about the AgroBioConnect project at NIAB. And this is a project which has been done in conjunction with uh, in partners in Europe as part of a larger project. And really the goal is to analyze arthropod biodiversity and the connected ecosystem services to it. And we're using a variety of tools uh, to achieve these objectives spread among the different partners. But what you're really keen on uh, at NIAB is to measure arthropod biodiversity and especially parasitoids, predators and pollinators. 
Um, and as mentioned, the tools that we're using and the met methods we're using include using traps and sampling. And there'll be a component of remote sensing uh, with partners based in Italy. <clears throat> in addition to that, uh, we are developing DNA barcoding methodology for parasitoid and solitary bee identification. And this has been informed largely because nobody is quite sure whether the barcodes we have in GenBank um, had, have got pre-identification by a specialist that they are the actual species. So how, how, how good are the barcodes uh, over there? And we don't really have so many barcodes specific to the UK. And eventually this data will inform the relationships among landscape parameters and ecosystem services, and particularly in yield. And we are domiciling this work within uh, Strawberry. So this is where we began. Uh, we began by doing a ranking of different farm landscapes, uh, just asking our colleagues and, and people who are within NIA to rank uh, different landscapes according to heterogeneity. So it's a bit subjective. And while there was reasonable agreement about extreme and low heterogeneity of the sites, there was less consensus about intermediate uh, heterogeneity in the, in the landscapes. Um, and so despite having a bit of preliminary data on that, uh, the team from Italy will be performing some more uh, detailed GIS analysis. But we're doing a lot more work uh, in the field. And as I mentioned earlier on, uh, we are working on strawberries. And what we are doing is um, collecting uh, uh, aphids and we incubate these until parasitoids emerge. And uh, for the bees, we do collect. Some of them are identified in the field. And eventually all this data, all these insects, the ones which we are not able to identify and for the parasitoids, we are creating molecular barcoding tools for species level uh, insect identification. Now this is quite tricky because uh, there's quite a large number of bee species in the UK. Uh, but for as many as we're able to get, we shall develop the backwards. So for the bee work, and this is work which has been uh, led mostly by Sarah Arnold, uh, my colleague in the department. Uh, for the bees, uh, what the team did was a 15 minute walk concept in the crop and in the margin. And they recorded all the bees. Uh, Bumble bees are recorded to the species level, uh, solitary bees to functional groups and honeybees. And all the solitary bees and any uncertain bee species were collected for DNA barcoding. So approximately 16 solitary bee species from 16 have been identified from the specimens, and all these will be confirmed by DNA analysis. For the parasitoid wasps, uh, it was either two person hours of such time looking for aphid colonies, which would be incubated later on in the lab, or 20 aphid colonies collected, whichever came first. Now, most sites yielded at least some aphids, with at least four species being recorded. And from the samples, over 500 parasite species have emerged, and uh, the work to identify them will progress over this winter. And this is just a slide to acknowledge uh, the growers who gave us permission to sample the different sites. And these are the 18 different sites that we were able to visit. So as mentioned again, uh, we've been able to do the uh, the survey in July, August 2023. We intend to repeat this work in spring of 24, in summer of 24, and in uh, the spring of 2025 to get you know, a lot of depth of coverage over these different you know, sites over the years. And uh, beam morphological ID for this year is complete. Uh, what's still to come is a parasite identification, and B in parasite DNA analysis will be an ongoing uh, component of this work. These are the bee species uh, identified so far. And there's quite a number of them. And this is all uh, close to where uh, the strawberries are grown. And these are the aphid species. So for aphid species, there's at least four to five that we've identified. Uh, aphids far by which in other parts of the world is a bean specialist. It turns out to be the major aphid on on strawberry, and I think this is probably something that needs to be investigated further. And for the parasitoid species, identification is ongoing. We've got so far 541 individuals, and we're getting um, from the periodization that we do keep it up to 11 parasitoids per colony. Now, 
Now, as I mentioned in my introduction, uh, part of the work involves developing and testing DNA barcoding methodology. And the goal is a database of genetic information about parasitoids and bees in the UK, and especially those around strawberry. Now, the barcodes, as I mentioned again, are needed to obtain a reliable and easily replicable tool for species level taxonomic resolution. So, so far for the parasitoid species, we've had type specimens identified in house uh, using standard morphological keys. And the work to generate the DNA barcodes uh, began with using three primer pairs uh, the commonly used mitochondrial DNA uh, primer, HCO, LCO, but also two variations of the 16S. Uh, in your gene. And after that, uh, we evaluated this uh, to find which gave us the best uh, resolution to species level. And we've got over 145 barcodes in head so far. These are going to increase dramatically as we ramp up the work over winter. So this figure that shows uh, part of the op optimization process, comparing um, the different, when we sequence the different genes, uh, what kind of resolution did we get? And this is how we arrived at using the HCO-LC primer pair as our primary uh, gene of interest, but we've also retained the 16S genes in, in case there'll be any ambiguities in the species demarcation. So if you look at figure one, you can see very clear species uh, demarcation between the four uh, type specimens which were sequenced, and this is Sanga sequencing, uh, but not uh, a very clear demarcation. Well, it is clear, but not as clear as uh, the one on the mitochondrial gene for the 16S. And I'd like to mention that this process will continue so that at any given time we're using type specimens which we know and they are known to be able to resolve those which we don't know. So for ongoing work, uh, there's now a lot of sequence information and uh, these sequences are being cleaned up and prepared for uploading to public databases as part of a unique UK data set uh, to ensure that these are easily found uh, will be very, very conscientious to the identifiers that we attach to the sequence information. Uh, for those who do this kind of taxonomic work, they know that these uh, gene sequences are very easy to upload onto GenBank, but they're usually lacking in key identifier information. And we currently have uh, robust uh, barcodes for prion, uh, volucre, Aphidias RV, Aphidias abdominalis, and Aphidias maticaria, and we are generating more as the day go on. And we'll now be switching to barcoding uh, the DNA from parasites which have been collected from the field and just working through those. And similarly for the B specimens, we'll be using the mitochondrial gene and another uh, and the 16S primer to again take it through the same process and then upload these uh, sequences into GenBank. Right, and I'll now take questions. Thank you so much, Francis. Uh, just a couple of things here. Uh, just comment from Laura, who was speaking earlier, saying that they've also found Avis Fabi in strawberries in the Midlands, and mm. there's an MSc student interested in working on that this year. Uh, and a question, another question, have you thought of working with the Bumblebee Conservation Trust that does many surveys around the country? Yeah. I don't know whether you're involved with them at all. Not directly, but yes, that's a very good point. I'll, I'll yeah. Um, good. Um, and then another question here. Do you have any information about genetic diversity on Aphidias ervi in strawberries? So once we're able to collect sufficient um, sequence information, uh, we'll be able to run that analysis. At the moment, we don't have enough uh, sequence information to do that. Okay. Yeah. Good. Okay. Well, thank you very much, Francis, for sharing that with us. And we're sticking to time. And we've now got... Um, Sarah is joining us, Sarah Arnold, who Right. Um, I will just maximize that. Hopefully that's looking good to everybody now. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. Sorry, I didn't realise I was on mute there. So I was giving a little bit of an explanation uh, to you. So I, my, my mistake. Just to, just to explain that Sarah's been doing a huge amount of work uh, on the Bespoke project. 
uh, B-W-E-S-P-O-K-E. If you haven't um, heard about Bespoke, please do search it on the internet. Just search for Bespoke. Um, uh, that project is something that uh, NIAB worked on in collaboration with scientists from um, Belgium, Netherlands, uh, Germany, Sweden, Norway and Denmark. Uh, to try and boost the numbers of pollinators and beneficial insects. And uh, a lot of that uh, work has resulted in some really good, useful grower guides and information. And as part of that, Sarah has been doing some splendid work trying to develop uh, wildflower mixes dedicated to soft fruit pollination. So, Sarah, tell us what you've done. Great. Thank you very much, Scott. With the increasing focus that we're getting on both the natural pollination of the soft fruit itself and also interest in conserving wild bees on farms more generally, um, particularly through kind of subsidy schemes and more interest coming from government and other bodies about this, the Bespoke Project has been quite interested in giving some evidence-based guidelines on what you can actually do and how to do it best. Um, so I'm going to be introducing a bit of what we're recommending at the moment and some of the resources that we've produced and how we've produced them. The background to this is that the main habitat that supports pollinators really is flower rich semi-natural grassland, so meadows and things like that. But the amount of that has absolutely crashed since basically after the world, the Second World War. So we've probably lost 97 to 98 percent of that. And that was the major resource for our pollinators. Um, so with perhaps seven and a half thousand hectares left countrywide, um, we need to think about what we can do on other types of land to try and replicate some of those resources resources um, and on soft root farms for example there is an opportunity to do that in a really effective way that gives benefits to everybody using the land and to the pollinators. Um, in UK fruit production generally, I suppose the typical thing has been to have sown alleyways between the rows of crops, and these are usually just um, a mixture of grasses. So they're not providing very much in the way of helpful resource for the pollinators. But there are things that we can potentially do with that um, that could perhaps improve that and possibly give uh, benefits to the crop as well. Some work by Michelle, especially, that was published last year, um, reviews all of this and brings it together. So Michelle reviewed a variety of different studies looking at the provision of wildflower strips and areas on fruit farms to look at whether that actually confers benefits or whether there's any drawbacks to doing this. And what you can see is that with, with regard to pollinators, basically any sort of wildflower intervention is either going to be neutral or almost invariably positive. And also in terms of pest management, there's very few case studies in which providing um, extra wildflowers is actually negative, so increases the pest pressure on the crop. The vast majority of the time, it's either neutral or positive for the crop. So broadly, we can conclude that wildflowers are a good thing um, and doing anything at all is probably beneficial. If we delve into that a little bit more, we know that a lot of fruit crops have got high reliance on insect pollination for fruit yield and fruit quality. Uh, and providing these wildflower strips, patches, areas will broadly increase the flower visits to the crop. Sometimes this results in an increase in the crop yield and the quality um, due to better pollination, but this can be a little bit variable, um, more likely to be in, in crops that are perhaps less attractive to pollinators and more pollen limited, rather than ones that will just get visited by pollinators all the time. And it's not a static thing in time either. So it, it's not as if um, putting in a wildflower strip will have the same benefits year on year. They actually do tend to improve and increase the more established you let them become. And that can be a particular reason for putting in perennial wildflower strips and wildflower areas rather than just relying on annual mixes. So, for example, in year six versus year one, um, after establishing a wildflower strip or area, the predator numbers tend to increase and also the ratio of predators relative to the prey tends to improve over that time. So in the first year, for example, you get better control of the spring aphids and in top fruit, for example, also coddling moth. The pollinator numbers and diversity can take a little bit longer to increase. So you start to see the benefits perhaps more after three to four years, but some sort of benefits start to realize even within the first year. 
So I'd encourage everyone to be patient with the wildflower areas and give them a bit of time to develop and mature. Um, but remember that it's not necessarily a maintenance free process. So thinking about how to do these wildflower strips, thinking, I think the core principles are probably think year round and think about heterogeneity and diversity. So plant size is good. Having, having bigger plants within your wildflower areas and strips uh, tends to provide a better habitat for beneficials. So the sward architecture, kind of more structural plants in there can be really good. Also means you've got overall more biomass and that can be good for things like carbon capture perhaps as well. Um, don't over mow if you possibly can, because if you're constantly taking away the tops of the flowers as soon as they're coming out, that's taking away the resources that wild bees would use. So there are ways around that. Um, if you can reduce the mowing regimes on the wildflower areas around the crop, that's really good. Um, if it's a row based kind of unprotected system where it's possible to uh, mow alternate rows or alternatively, if, it, if it's a wildflower patch, then perhaps mow half of it at one point and then a couple of weeks later mow the other half. So you're allowing a little bit of regeneration in between those mowing cycles. And it means that those uh, the wild bees and the other pollinators and the other beneficials are able to move from the mown area to the unmown area and continue to forage, continue to have resources. So that should give you more of a continuity of the populations and something that's a bit more stable. Um, in general, the, the more you can allow those plants to grow, that tends to be better. So letting it sit at 20 centimetres is good. You could also consider just putting in a single autumn cut. That can be good because it allows some of those plants to get through the whole life cycle and get some seeds into the seed bank, which can benefit the following year and future years, especially if there are annual and biennial plants in there as well. Um, so think about kind of relaxing the regimes as much as is practical and tolerable for the system that you're working in. Thinking about the size, normally we think about semi-natural habitats as the, um, as the key to wild bee diversity and other beneficials. Um, but some of these wild air, uh, some of the, the wildflower patches, the ones that are purpose sown on farms can have higher flower density and actually offer more resource per unit area compared to some of the more kind of natural environments. So they can be really high value resources. And this means that you can get a lot from a relatively small area. Um, so at the moment we're recommending about 2% flower rich habitat per farm. And if you look around the edges of, of the farm, then if there's about a kilometer of flowering hedgerow in total, that can be really valuable for supporting perhaps six common pollinator species. But obviously we need to think about what's appropriate to the system and the right plants that work within what else is happening on the farm. Several small fragments can be really quite valuable. Um, so there's good evidence from butterflies and parasitoids that small areas themselves give quite a lot of benefit. And multiple small areas can act as a kind of insurance policy, meaning that if one of them receives damage for some reason, perhaps due to weather conditions or management intervention, then other areas will maintain some of those populations of really valuable bees and beneficials. Um, so that they can kind of restock in the future. And again, thinking with the composition, again, it's about getting that diversity in there. So different types of sward architecture, different species of plants. Um, if possible, make it complementary to what's in the wider environment. Um, so adding in things that the that uh, bees and other pollinators might not necessarily be able to find in surrounding areas. Think about the pollinator's whole life cycle. So not just about what's there when the crop is flowering, but what's there when the crop isn't flowering. Are there early flowering or late flowering plants that can be included in wildflower mixes or allowed to regenerate? And think about the placement. Are there ways to put your wildflower resources close to where bees might nest? So if you're putting in bee hotels or something like that, can you put wildflower resources nearby? Um, I could go into depth about kind of alternative nesting materials for bees, but there probably isn't time today. 
Um, and more of that flower diversity, the plant diversity, will also provide better nutritional quality. And that can be really valuable for supporting the health of a wide variety of bees. It will mean that they live longer and produce more offspring. So you get the stability in populations over the years. And also that plant diversity will give you those later season resources, which can help the bees kind of finish off their life cycle and again, set them up really well for the following year. The Bespoke Project has been developing a range of new resources to help you select wildflower species, start up wildflower patches, think about perennial resources rather than just annual resources. So I'll walk you through some of the ones that we've created. So the first principle was to understand what bees and hoverflies are actually the crop visitors and pollinators for any given crop so that we can provide crop tailored ideas. Then we wanted to understand, apart from the crop, what are the flowers and plants in the environment are they actually using? And then which of these might be most suitable for a sown or regenerated strip on a fruit farm? I'll take you through the example of raspberries. Um, so for this, we started with a big literature search and found out every data set we possibly could on known insect visitors to raspberry flowers in the UK and drew a little bit on... Um, countries just outside the UK but with a similar sort of system, assembled all of this information together and ranked it to find out what are the most common consistent um, insect species, bees and hoverflies that are popping up as visiting raspberries in multiple different studies and data sets. Um, and so for raspberries, these were the kind of top six that were most consistently coming out. And uh, that's, uh, sorry, top five. That's three species of bumblebees. These are all really common general bumblebees that you'll find pretty much UK wide. Um, two of which have got two generations per year and one of which tends to be one generation per year, but they're all active around the raspberry flowering period. Also two species of essentially solitary bee that nest in kind of bare soil patches. So that means that providing the nesting habitat can also be quite important because they've got relatively small flight ranges and will really benefit from, from the soil patches. All of these are fairly open-minded about the type of flowers that they want to visit. So we started to look at existing databases of flower, uh, flower visits. So which um, which of these flowers that are perhaps present in the UK are visited by any of those bee species and which ones are visited most commonly. We excluded anything that was purely ornamental, so only found in, in kind of gardens and parks. Um, anything that was woody, because that might be much more impractical to maintain if you're trying to put in a wildflower strip, because it's going to be a real problem for mowing and things. And we also excluded bulbs because they can be a little bit odd in their behaviour, uh, but we can always revisit that in the future. And this meant that we came out with final lists of um, a sensible number of species to consider. And some of these are ones that would be found in wildflower mixes. Some of these are ones that would probably be in the natural seed bank. So essentially weeds that will pop up anyway. Um, so an approach that includes a bit of re and a bit of natural regeneration should bring some of these in. And the idea is that with those plants, you'd capture those top kind of five or six major pollinators per crop. Not all of the plants will be suitable for every single site. We understand that, but it's a starting point for further discussions with things like your seed companies and agronomists. Um, a few plant species just pop up again and again for every crop. Um, some of them, um, like these plants along the top, are ones that are particularly attractive to bumblebees because they're nectar rich, but have got a slightly more kind of specialised shape that means that um, kind of um, flies and things might find them a little bit more difficult to use, but they're really valuable resources for some of those major pollinators. Some of them, like the plants along the bottom, have the advantage of being of having quite a wide flowering period. Some of them are quite late flowering and they can be used by a whole diversity of different pollinator species. So uh, including small bees and so on. So they can be really valuable too. And a mixture of both will support that maximum diversity of pollinators that can be really good. Um, I'm nearly done, but I'll just add that there were some warning messages that we've put in, if you like. And that's because some of these wildflowers have the potential to be partial or occasional hosts of 
crop pests or diseases. Most of the time, the risk is more of a kind of theoretical, hypothetical one. Um, but we wanted to give you a full picture of the information so that you could make more informed decisions. Where to find all of these? Um, NorthSeaRegion.eu slash bespoke. Um, and it's not just the matching pollinators to flowers leaflets, but also seed mix recommendations, establishment guidelines and ways to monitor and measure the pollination on the farms. Um, so all of those resources are available if you if you're interested in them. Um, I can leave the QR code up um, just acknowledging various people who've been involved in the bespoke project and other projects around this program of work. Um, and thank you very much for listening. Thank you, Sarah. Um, very comprehensive. Um, there are no questions coming in at the, mo the moment, but I just wanted to add to what Sarah said. We, Some of you may have attended, but not all of you will. Uh, we hosted our bespoke uh, open event uh, in autumn 2022, so just a little bit over the, a year ago, which was very well attended. Uh, but at that, we had a number of presentations on how to manage wildflower strips, the benefits of them, uh, and some of the difficulties to overcome. Um, you can find the presentations from that event on our NIAB website. And uh, whilst talking about the NIAB website, um, please remember we have a whole range of other facilities uh, and publications. So there's this one here, the NIAB Fruit Review Magazine, which uh, is available there online. Um, and we have other guides and uh, a, a catalogue of information there, which you can tap into. So please do use that opportunity. Um, Sarah, thank you so much for your time and for all the work you've done, because I, I did take some of your leaflets to the recent National Fruit Show and the Vineyard and Winery Show, and they were quite uh, rapidly snapped up. So uh, thank you for all your, all your efforts on our behalf. So that takes us on to the final three presentations of this afternoon, um, which are all on Spotted Wing Drosophila. Um, the first of these is another PhD student, Fardina um, Rahimi and... Fardina is a PhD student as part of the SOCO Bio system. SOCO Bio stands for South Coast Biological Sciences. Um, and she's going to, she's based at Southampton University. She's going to share with us some of the what she's doing on microbial signaling and how this can influence SWD egg laying. So Fardina, tell us what you've been finding. Um, you're on mute at the moment. Um, you can unmute yourself. We're getting a bit of interference there. Looks like uh, Fardina's going to just put some earphones or headphones on. Uh, yeah. it's... Can you hear me now? Yeah, that's better. I think we've got you. Thank you, Fardina. Perfect. I'm just going to share my screen now. It's good. Thank you. Can you see my screen now? Yes, that's great. If you could just hit slideshow. Okay. Perfect. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Uh, so my project is fly associated bacteria can influence spotted wing doors of blood egg lake. As you can see, this is the female spotted wing uh, SWD. Um, this is the male which has a um, spot on its wing. And this is an example of a uh, and to also fly Margas and the fruit fly that we see sometimes in our kitchen around the root and fruit. So when I say fly associated bacteria, I'm talking about fruit fly that we see in the kitchen, which we call a Dorsophila malargasa in the lab. So where this story actually start, um, a previous PhD student, me, a student before me, she found that we can reduce Dorsophila suzuki images or we also call SWD Dorsophila suzuki images through interspecies competition. So what she found, that Durosophila suzukii or spotted wing Durosophila um, uh, don't like to lay their egg in the media of, uh, which was visited by Durosophila melanogaster uh, beforehand. So I want to identify those, uh, the nature of those interspecies signal. I want to see, is it because a spotted wing Durosophila see the, uh, the eggs and don't like to lay, to lay their eggs in the same media? Is it the bacteria? What is it? And if we find, if I find those signal, can we use it to control SWD? 
So the question is, can Drosophilomonic acid associated bacteria influence stability egg link? How I come up with this question based on many experiments that I did initially in the lab three years ago, but I don't, I just want to focus on bacteria for the purpose of this talk. So in the lab, um, in order to answer this question, uh, I make use of a um, different wild type group. So these are the three wild type of strain that I use. These are those of the the native fruit fly that eat on rotten food, um, the name of the more cantonous organ are Berlin K. These are three wild type group, don't have any mutation. They just collected from different part of the world, such as Italy, USA, and Germany. And I also used one mutant line. This is what I call DTS100. They have curly wings, if you compare it to the wild type, and they are sensitive to high temperature. And also they have more hair uh, compared to the wild type group. So to answer this question, uh, what sort of assay I do in the lab, what I do, I expose one of these media to Drosophila melanic acid for 24 hours and one of them to nothing, which we call control. So then after 24 hours, I get rid of the Drosophila melanic acid and then transfer a T Suzuki inside um, the same uh, box along with this control plate. I count the number of eggs laid by Drosophilomonic acid before transferring the SWD. After 24 hours, I get rid of the SWD and count the number of eggs laid by SWD in control and experimental one. Obviously, I subtract the number of Drosophilomonic acid egg from the total number of eggs which I got here. To analyze my data, I use SWD egg in control which is this one, minus SWD in experimental one divided by total number of egg. So uh, just if I, I know some, sometimes the graphs are confusing for people, but just if we have the graph on the top, that means they are repellent. So the SWD doesn't like to lay their egg in the experimental plate, but if they are attractive, or attract, that means they SWD like to lay their egg in the experimental plate. As you can see, the three wild type group repel uh, spotted wing Dorosophila um, egg laying, and um, uh, um, the DTS 100, which is the mutant line, um, attract uh, SWD egg laying or enhance. Hard to know. Sorry yes. to interrupt you. We just had a request. Can, 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 can you move the mouthpiece closer to your mouth on your headphones? Have, have you got that facility to do that? That's it. Perfect. Sorry to... It's a be is it better now? That's better. Thank you. Sorry okay. to interrupt you. Okay. No, that's okay. Okay. Then what I did, I uh, treated these Dorosophila americasa, which you see in the previous slide, these Dorosophila americasa with antibiotic and 5% bleach. When I treat these flies with antibiotic, that means I change their microbiome. So we feed these flies with antibiotic before exposing the experimental plate. As you can see, after I treat Dorosophila americasa, um, with antibiotic and 5% bleach, they don't show any preference between control and experimental plate. So Drosophila, so a spotted wing Drosophila, doesn't matter, they don't care if it is experimental or control plate, they lay their egg in, in any of the plate. So in conclusion, Drosophila malaricacer associated bacteria are responsible for the observed effect on SWD egg laying. So the next step was, can we find out which bacteria only are involved? So just based on the research that other people did, many, many research, the Drosophila malaria microbiome is not very diverse, and they contain mostly Acetobacter and Lactobacillus, and also they have intercellular bacteria, which is called Wobachii. So Wobachii lives inside the cell of the flies. And this is what I do in the lab. Uh, to produce these bacteria and do more experiment on it. So what I did, we saw some of the Dorosophila malaricacea line are attractive and some of them are repellent to uh, SWD. So the next step was to analyze their microbiome, do DNA extraction. And as you can see, 
um, I have some contamination in one of my sample, but as you can see, the attractive line contain a lot of acetobacter and very small amount of Wobachii, that intercellular bacteria, which I showed you in the previous slide. However, the repellent line, the, I uh, did analysis for four uh, wild type group. And as you can see, they contain a lot of Wobachii and very small amount of Acetobacter. And this is at the larvae stage. Again, um, this is also the case for DTS-100 larvae. They have a lot of Acetobacter, very small amount of Wobachii. And again, as you can see for the larvae building K, they have a lot of Wobachii and very small amount of Acetobacter. And as you can see these, if you just look at them carefully, they follow the same pattern. The I'm talking about the repellent line. They have a lot of Wobachii compared to the DTS-100, which was my mutant line. So in conclusion, SWD egg is repelled by the wild type Drosophila maricaster, but attracted by DTS-100. We saw that the microbiome was different. Drosophila maricaster associated bacteria are responsible for the observed effect on SWD egg This is based on the antibiotic and 5% bleached um, treatment that I did. And we also saw that repellent microbiome include more Wobachii and Lactobacillus and less Acetobacter when compared to the attractive microbiome. So what are the next steps for me? So the next step um, for me is I want to test whether Drosophila maricaster Wobachii can determine the impact on Drosophila suzukii um, on a spotted wing Drosophila egg laying following pre exposure. I also want to identify the specific bacteria and their metabolites for impact on SWD egg laying. So for example, if we find the attractive metabolite, we can use them for the trapping, the SWD, and if we find the repellent bacteria, we can use them around the crop to stop um, SWD infestation. And obviously, whatever I find in the lab, we're going to apply it on the field, and hopefully we can stop infestation of SWD. There are a lot of work to do, and I had many data, but I, didn't, I wasn't able to show everything. But this is just the final story. As you can see, I included my email here. So if you have any question, just please email me. <laughs> Thank you for listening. Thank you, Fadina. Um, question from Michelle, actually, is uh, yeah. how, how good is the DNA sequencing at quantifying the microbiome? Is it related to the number of cells or volume of DNA? Sorry, can you repeat again? Sorry, I just yeah. missed that question. Okay, so she, Michelle is asking, how good is the DNA sequencing at quantifying the microbiome? Is it related to the number of cells or volume of DNA? At volume of the DNA, I would say, yeah. It's not, sorry, it's about number of the cells. Um, so for uh, when I did the DNA analysis, uh, we have, um, obviously I didn't show that data here, we have the number of reads for each specific bacteria. And uh, the number of reads was uh, very high for Acetobacter. And obviously it was uh, smaller for Lactobacillus. And it is it is about the number of cell and number of reads for each of, each of the bacteria and not about the volume of the DNA. Okay. Thank you for Dina. Um, perhaps we can draw Michelle in now because Michelle's going to be our next speaker. Michelle, do you want to? Uh, and and thank you, thank you so much for Dina. Um, okay. Michelle, just if I've, I've, we've got Michelle now, um, Michelle, do you, what do you see for the future of this? I mean, is this does this sort of work that Fardina's doing, which has been making great progress by the sounds of it, um, is that something that could be a practical solution in the longer term? Yeah, I think it. It sort of relates to some of the work that Rory Jones did as well, but he was working on the fungal community. And I think if we, it might give us options for changing the microbiome on the fruit surface to make it less attractive to SWD. Maybe if we can persuade SWD that Melanogaster is already there, even if it isn't, then it might be less likely to lay eggs. I think that's what we're, the way we're thinking that might go forward. Uh, can I just include one more thing? I do actually um, uh, fungi analysis for the wild type uh, that I collected from NIAB a few months ago. So hopefully we, if we can get those data um, and also compare the microbiome of the wild type SWD from what we have in the lab, we can get, we we very more confident about the result and find out how we can control SWD. Good. Thank you, Fardina. Thank you for all your good work that you're doing. Good luck with the rest of your studies and thank you for helping us this afternoon.
So that takes us nicely into Michelle. Um, and Michelle is going to be dealing with SWD bait sprays. This is something that we've been talking about for a number of years now, and we've done quite a lot of work. Uh, the latest work has been looking at the impact of SWD bait sprays on non-target non organisms and insects, because that's a question that we've been repeatedly asked. Uh, and Michelle's going to explain a little bit more about what we've done about it. OK, thank you. Um, I'm going to use Matt's example and get my laser pointer out. OK, so um, obviously in the past, we have done many experiments with um, microbiotech on uh, controlling SWD with these bait sprays. Um, so I'm not going to present any of the results on that work at the moment um, or today, but we have shown that it's effective in strawberry, raspberry and in cherry. It's as equally effective as putting on a full foliar application. And I'll go on to explain exactly what a bait spray is in a moment. Um, but a lot of the questions we've been getting over the last sort of three or four years are, are the bait sprays more attractive to some of our beneficial non-target insects? And will they have a detrimental effect on those insects in the crop? So just to remind you what bait sprays are, they're um, a phagostimulant, so they um, entice the pest insect to feed on the spray. So there'll be something that's attractive and tasty, and that'll be mixed with um, a plant protection product, in this case, an insecticide for SWD. But instead of being sprayed as small droplets as a full foliar application, they're actually put on as large droplets and that means that the, the insect goes to the bait rather than us having to target the insect with the insecticide. So it works more effectively. Um, and what this, of course, means is that you don't need to spray the fruit necessarily. The spray can just be put on the foliage as an example. And what I'm going to present now are the... Um, results on beneficial insects in a commercial raspberry trial and also in um, um, screening several beneficial insects in laboratory studies. Um, so this is where the commercial field trial was done and just to say this was a replicated trial where each plot um, was divided by mesh to stop uh, migration of SWD between the plots but also um, for the beneficial insects as well. And this is quite a, a long detailed table, but I just want to point out a few of the highlights from this. So these were the uh, six treatments. We didn't have an untreated control because it was on a commercial farm and we didn't want to risk a buildup of SWD in any part of the crop. Um, so we had the positive control at the top, which is a full foliar application of um, weekly applications of alternating spinosad and tracer, so without any bait. Then we had the um, full foliar applications at 50% and at 25%. And we tested these as a band with large droplets uh, with the bait, either Combi Protect or ProBands. And we used 50% or below because that's the um, recommendation on the adjuvant label. So these baits are um, approved as adjuvants. Um, and here you can see the, one of the big differences is the water volume. So we're using 500 litres per hectare with a full foliar and only 40 litres per hectare um, with the band sprays. And this obviously means that um, we can get through the, the crop much quicker. And also we're not having to return to fill the tank as often. Um, so these rates were agreed with the chemical companies that we were working with. And just to note that um, before you embark on any bait spraying, please do check what the approvals are for your crops for the different insecticides and baits. So XRL is not approved for use um, with an adjuvant in commercial cropping. So I'm going to go on to the results now. So here we see that. So these are the, the different treatments. Um, the bars are showing different treatments in um, August and in September. And we got no significant difference in bumblebee numbers. Um, between the treatments and the same was um, seen with honeybees although the numbers were much lower in September um, there was no difference between treatments. We also did observations of where the bees were landing and um, they were generally landing on the flowers and fruits and we watched them on the leaves and there was no observations of them feeding on the bait droplets that we had applied. The other um, 
some of the other predators that we considered, um, so we tap sampled for these were aureus, parasitoids and predatory spiders. And there was no significant difference between the treatments in the number of those in the crops. So that was the, the field study. Um, and there are also results on SWD control for that study, which are um, reported by AHDB. So then we were um, we went on to do some lab studies so we could screen more insects and we can give them a really robust test because we're actually enclosing them in an arena with the insecticides. And in this case, we were looking at um, tracer applied alone, the two different baits applied alone. Then we had tracer combined with um, the baits and for pro bands, we only looked at this for aureus because it came towards the end of the project um, where probands had just been approved. And these were all compared to uh, untreated or water control. So the beneficial insects that we looked at were hoverflies, earwigs. We also included Drosophila melanogaster, who the um, Fardine has just been talking about as a non-target insect, but closely related to SWD. And we had aureus, lacewing larvae and ladybirds uh, larvae. And you can see here that we also provided them with alternative food, but the mortality assessments that we did um, were different lengths and that depended on the life expectancy of those beneficial insects. And this is just an idea of what some of the arenas looked like. Um, so you can see here the leaves have got the droplets on. So um, in this arena, we've got 12 droplets, six per leaf of one of the treatments, and that could either be water, bait, or a combination of insecticide and bait. Mm -hmm. um, with SWD, we do it slightly different in these kind of pot arenas, and that, that seems to work well for those. So I'm just going to run through the results now, and the insects that we tested broadly fitted into three main groups. And the first group included adult hoverflies, aureus, and earwigs. And in this group, spinosad on its own and spin, um, was no more toxic than spinosad with bait. So they were equivalent in their toxicity to the insects, but they were significantly more um, toxic than water or bait alone. So and applying a bait for these insects with an insecticide is no more toxic than applying the insecticide alone as large droplets. And then we had the second group, which was Drosophila melanogaster. And this showed a very um, similar response that you get in SWD. So where we have spinosad um, with the bait, which is the yellow line, um, you get um, much more kill and significantly faster kill. And this is presumably because the fly is attracted to the bait and it's feeding on the bait. So it's um, dying much quicker. And then in the final group, this included our lacewing and ladybird larvae, so less mobile stages. And these weren't impacted um, by the uh, baits mixed with insecticide or even the insecticide on its own. So they either weren't making contact or they just weren't sensitive to um, those doses of spinosad. So in conclusion, I'd just like to um, wrap up by saying that pollinator for foraging was not impacted um, by our field trials in terms of the bait. So they weren't attracted to the bait and they weren't feeding on it in our observations. Um, and the bait was generally, um, bait on its own is not toxic. And we showed that in the laboratory studies. Um, there was a rapid, a more rapid mortality with, if you add spinosad to bait for the non-target um, fruit fly melanogaster, which is maybe not surprising as it's closely related to SWD. Mortality um, is not increased uh, when spinosad is added to the bait. So these top three, um, earwigs, aureus and hoverfly, um, it was no more toxic than just spinosad alone. Um, and it didn't seem to be at all toxic to lacewing larvae or um, ladybird larvae. So baits plus spinosad applied indirectly as large droplets are no more toxic to beneficial insects than the large droplets of spinosad alone. And I think the take home messages from this study is that in principle, exposure to the, to the insecticides 
um, is reduced if you're using a bait spray because you're applying less product. It's usually away from the fruits and flowers, um, away from where most of the beneficial insects might be visiting. Um, and it also has an impact on reducing residues in fresh produce. So I think in, in terms of future biocontrol programs, not just for SWD, but for other pests that these predators um, protect against, this is really good news. Um, and that is my um, presentation completed. So I'd like to invite any questions if there's time. Thank you, Scott. Thank you very much, Michelle. Yeah, I, I think we always make this point, but uh, the probands or baits probands or combi protect cannot be used with emergency authorizations, uh, emergency authorized products. Um, now, to that end, with uh, cherries, I know this is a soft fruit event, but just to say with cherries, we are trying to secure a NEMU for tracer with cherry. Um, but yeah, so in terms of the soft fruit crops, you need to really check with your basis qualified consultant before you make any decisions on, on using these bait sprays. But uh, I think we've got, we've come a long way with this over the last year, Michelle. So thank you very much for all your work. Don't think there's any more questions on that, um, but please hang around just in case there are, because um, we all want to wait to the, we keep the best till last. And we have Glenn Slade from Big Sis, uh, I, I should just say Glenn's been very kindly stepped in at quite short notice because we did have another pl planned talk and we felt that probably there wasn't enough new information from the talk uh, we had planned. So we've slotted Glenn in at short notice and he's going to tell us all about what he's uh, developed and what he's been finding with um, sterile insect technique in raspberry production this year. So Glenn, over to you. Thanks very much. Uh, Scott, good afternoon, everybody. Um, thanks very much for the opportunity to present this afternoon. And hopefully um, that's going to get us there. Right, get rid of that. So, um, yeah, giving you an update on what we've been doing at Big Sis uh, with our sterile insect technique uh, solution for controlling SWD. Um, a quick introduction for anybody who's not familiar with uh, SIT already. Uh, what we're doing is producing sterile males of the target pest. Um, we are then releasing them regularly where we would expect to find wild females, typically in a crop. Uh, those females then have no offspring. Um, and that has what I call axiomatic efficacy because that equation of sterile male plus wild female equals zero works, you know, regardless of the crop or the weather or the, you know, other pests or whatever else. Um, and it's an extremely effective solution as I'll come on to show you. But it's also, of course, an extremely safe, uh, beneficial solution. It's species specific, uh, non-toxic, can't establish in the environment. And in the case of Bixis, it's non-GMO and we're using native strains. So actually uh, the regulators can't really find a risk to regulate. Uh, we're approved for sale without a permit here in England and in a number of other jurisdictions. Um, and that's enabled us to move quickly into the field. Our first solution targets, as you would guess, spotted wing drosophila. Um, and a couple of years ago now, uh, in partnership with NIAB and also Berry Gardens, we were the first in the world to use the sterile insect technique to control SWD in commercial crops. Um, it was very successful. It's now been published in the journal Insects. Uh, you can see on this chart the treated area where we released uh, sterile males regularly, basically flatlined for the whole season in terms of wild females per trap. Um, and the site that did not receive sterile males had a typical increase in SWD during that season. Um, we had up to 91% suppression. And in the late season when the um, untreated site was sprayed with insecticide, we could see that it just didn't achieve the same level of control as we'd achieved all year. Now, building um, on that uh, with 2023 results, let me first of all just introduce what Big Sis does differently to enable us to do these SIT uh, solutions is to automate the production of our sterile male SWD. But to date, we've actually been depending primarily on manual production um, and we're doing that just to get the data through quicker in the field. And I'll update you on the automation in a minute. Um, but let me first of all say that uh, 
Whereas last year, 2022, I had to report that we had struggled with production in the middle of the season. I'm pleased to say that in 2023, our um, revised sterile mail SWD production protocols with manual methods um, have been ironed out and we had uh, a lot of success and were able to successfully treat a total of 22 hectares of raspberry and cherry crops. Um, and half of that was an 11 hectare raspberry site, uh, which was a paid trial um, sponsored by a global berry brand. Um, on the left, you can see the treated site. Um, uh, it's typical open polytunnel setup uh, with three blocks of different maturities, early, mid and late harvest running from early July through to early September. Um, and there was no chemical insecticide applied in the SIT treated site. Uh, the control sites were chosen by the trial sponsor um, very meticulously to match variety and the planting and the, the, the stage of uh, development of those plants. Um, and those sites each received one spray of spinosad during their harvest period. Um, moving on to the results, uh, well, there were two metrics that we used. Um, the first one is the big cis standard uh, sticky trap, um, the same one that we used for the trial on strawberries in 2021. Um, and the trial sponsor also contracted NIAB to do regular flotation tests on the raspberries during the harvesting period to see what the impact was on the quality of the fruit. So looking at the adult females per trap, uh, sticky trap first, um, you can see a number of things. Uh, the blue bars are the untreated control, or I should say insecticide treated control. Um, and you can see, first of all, that they sort of increase across the season, as you would expect, as the SWD pressure builds up. Um, these figures represent an average across the five weeks of the harvesting interval. Um, you'll also spot that the treated site actually had more adults in the early harvesting phase. And that's because we started our releases here a bit later than we would have liked to. Um, so we certainly didn't get the easy field out of treaters and control. Um, but as you can see by the middle uh, block, we had already achieved an 88% reduction in adults. Um, and that was fairly well sustained, 79% uh, better performance of adult females in the late block. And I think those results are pretty comparable to the uh, suppression of up to 91% in strawberries, particularly because this was compared to a single spray of spinosad as opposed to untreated uh, strawberries. Um, and I'm also very pleased to say that if you just look at that early block again, although there were more adults in that plot during the early season, in terms of larvae per fruit, we still managed to get a 60% reduction and what we attribute that to is the fact that our sterile males, although they'd not reduced the next generation, they had still sterilized many of the adults that were in the field. And of course, sterile eggs that may have been laid in those fruits do not get detected in the flotation tests. So we still got better larvae per fruit in the early season, even though we were high on adults. Um, and of course, later in the season, that sustained suppression translated to basically around 80% fewer larvae per fruit. Um, and that, of course, is brilliant in terms of reducing the risk of rejection. And if you're sampling 10 fruit, that's actually up to 9 million times less chance of getting a batch rejected across the set. Um, the other bit of data we got from this year's trial was uh, how much fruit was wasted at the time of harvest. In other words, what were pickers throwing away? Obviously, this won't only be due to SWD, this will be due to moldy fruit, small fruit, whatever else. Um, but across the set, uh, there was actually a, an equivalent of a 0.68% yield gain um, across those different uh, treatment blocks. So all in all, across those three different um, data points, adults, larvae, and fruit waste, um, we've been absolutely thrilled with those results. Now, just a reminder uh, of how we work, uh, for those who've not seen this before, 
Um, basically, Bixis offers uh, SWD control as a season long service. So we don't just produce uh, sterile mails and sell those. We actually do the releases on the field and then trap and report to the customer the evolution of the uh, pest. Um, so hopefully that makes it easier for growers to adopt. They don't have to learn the system or find labor. Um, and it means we can keep learning and ensure the quality of what we're doing. Um, it's great that we're already in the market. It's, it's got a lot of attention for us. I'm proud to say we were nominated by Bloomberg UK as a startup to watch and previously by Tesco as a, a runner up in their startup competition. But you know, also very importantly, continuing to build our relationship with NIAB. We've just uh, won another grant with to work on Blackberries next year and with Berry Gardens, who we're continuing to uh, collaborate with them and their growers on the way forward into the market. Um, and now as we're starting to scale up production, which I'm about to come on to, um, in discussions with the, the leading distributors uh, and other potential commercialization partners. Um, and so let me just end uh, telling you about progress with our automated production. Um, first of all, the, the pictures at the top summarize how it works. Uh, in the next couple of weeks, we'll have a video on our website, uh, which these are extracts from. This is just being finalized. But basically what we're doing in our factory is rearing insects individually. So these tiny little pots are getting a shot of 50 microliters of diet. Um, in a special cage, uh, SWD can lay their eggs in there. Artificial intelligence is used to spot when an egg's been laid. Um, we add a lid uh, to that pot so we can then incubate them. Um, a different machine with artificial intelligence then picks out pots where an adult has emerged uh, and it goes through to a separate area where males can be separated from females. Those get counted into release files and pass through our bespoke x-ray machine for sterilization. Now, where we were in the middle of this season, I'd hope to be able to produce higher volumes of sterile males with this process. Um, in fact, we needed to do a few more months work to, to solve some uptime problems with our factory. Um, just been demonstrating that earlier today and pleased to say it, it's going really well. So we're basically ready to take the, this, the machinery that we've built to produce these sterile males um, and just more copies of those machines will produce the millions of flies per week that we need to treat up to 200 hectares for 2024. Um, and then the intention is to put that into a bigger building and treat uh, at least 600 hectares in 2025. Um, and I'll end there. I hope that's been a helpful update. Happy to take any questions. Thank you, Glenn. Yeah, okay. It's nice to finish our event on a positive note, which is great news. It's, it's all going, sounds as if it's going really well. Um, I've got one question I'll put to you. Given the numbers that you're managing, automated numbers you're managing to produce, um, how easy will it be? It's one thing to produce those. How easy will it be to distribute them onto the farms that you're treating? Um, we found this year it, it's actually very easy. What we've got as a, a simple model for the time being is that we post those flies to the farm. And at the farm, we've contracted locally part-time workers to do the releases on the appointed times. Um, it may be that in future we um, work with growers or work with our distribution partners to get other people to to release instead of us, but at the, the moment that's how it works. Okay, and, and the release process, how easy is that? Well, we do it all ourselves. So okay. that, basically it's manual at the moment. And we envisage that becoming an automated process in future. Um, but yes, our staff walk around and do that release on behalf of the growers. So it's almost okay. an invisible service um, and, and takes care of the SWD. Good. Thank you. Well, just interesting that uh, we should finish on this note. And I'll just make the point that uh, I'm currently working with uh, Carlos Duarte at Horticulture Crop Protection. Um, and we're trying to secure emergency authorizations for 2024 um, for our control products that we've continually applied for year after year. Um, and it's been really helpful to us uh, being able to demonstrate to um, CRD and the Expert Committee on Pesticides that we are doing such a wide range of research to find alternative ways of controlling the pest. Uh, and the work that you're doing is, is, is a major part of that. And that gives them encouragement that maybe in the future, one day, we're going to be less reliant, reliant on some of these products um, rather than... Uh, 
just completely reliant on them as we have been in the past. So that's good. Thank you. So thank you for all your work. Thank you, uh, Glenn. So that brings us to the end of today's event. I'm just going to um, share my screen now. Um, again, just with some slides to finish off. Um, there we are. Um, so that concludes session three. I'm just trying to move slide on. There we go. So um, first of all, thank you to all our presenters today and all the excellent presentations that we've we've seen. Without uh, without them, today wouldn't be possible. Um, another chance for you if you haven't yet done so and you want to submit your basis and Eroso details on the link chat in in the link chat. Uh, sorry. Uh, on the links in the chat box. Um, if you scroll right back up to the top of the chat, um, you can do that online. Um, if you do have any further questions, and I know some of you have um, submitted those through the chat function, I have made a note of them and um, I will get back to you. But if anybody has any further questions after the event, please contact me at that email address, scott.raffle at niab.com and I'll, um, I'll pass them on to the presenters. Just a reminder again that today um, has been recorded and we will be uploading it hopefully in the next uh, week or so onto our NIAB website, www.niab.com. Um, just finally, just to say further interaction with us at NIAB, um, if you do want to receive more information from us uh, and you haven't yet registered to receive NIAB fruit information, you can get in touch with me, uh, Scott Raffle at, again, my email address there, scott.raffle at niab.com. Um, we hope you found today useful. Um, if you've got any feedback from today or any views on, on how we might do things differently, um, I'd be very, very grateful if you could send me your thoughts uh, because we always try and improve and enrich the, the, the interaction that we have with you, the industry. So I think that pretty much brings us to a close. Thank you again for joining us. And um, I hope you've still got some productive hours left in today. And uh, we look forward to seeing you all soon. Thanks again.